Hi, my name is Arlene Johnson. Welcome to this course on Conservation Essentials, providing you with the vital skills you'll need to implement and manage your conservation projects. This course covers step three of the conservation standards, but before we get started on step three, in this module we'll review some key concepts of the first two steps of the conservation standards. As we said in the introduction, conservation challenges are multifaceted and complex. We often operate in contexts where there's a high degree of uncertainty, and this could easily lead to project paralysis. But fortunately, the conservation standards provide us with a way forward, despite such uncertainty. Step by step, it guides us to use the best available evidence and where uncertainty still exists to iteratively monitor and evaluate to generate evidence about what works, what does not, and adapt accordingly. The groundwork for this process is laid in steps one and two, the planning phase, with which you're already familiar, but we need to take our plans and successfully implement them so that our projects can get off the ground. This module serves as a brief review of steps one and two of the conservation standards. All students in this course should have prior knowledge of these steps, and this module should serve as a refresher for you. In this module, we'll go over the five steps of the conservation standards cycle. We'll also review the key concepts and terminology of step one, assess, and step two, plan. As part of that, we'll revisit the products and outputs of the first two steps, including conservation targets, viability analysis, direct threats and ratings, situation models, and strategic plan components. These components include results chains, activities, goals, objectives, and a monitoring plan. All of these products help inform the implementation of your plan. But this module is not just about looking back. It's also about looking forward you will get a preview of what is involved in step three of the conservation standards cycle, where you start the implementation of a conservation project, and which conservation standards outputs you need to start this journey. So in essence, this module sets the scene so that you and your team are ready to begin the all important next steps of implementing your conservation plan. By the end of this module, you'll be able to demonstrate the following skills or competencies. Identify where in the conservation standards cycle you are and how step three implement fits into it. Identify and prepare appropriate conservation standards outputs for use in step three. Develop and revise your results chains and navigate Marathi and explore and revise the diagrams in it. The conservation standard shown here provide a description of the five steps in the standards of practice high-level principles, and the expected outputs for each practice. The first sections of the conservation standards are included in the readings for this first module in the course. You can find and download the conservation standards from the reading section for module one on the course website. The conservation standards are organized into a five-step project management cycle. Good conservation practice means going through these steps iteratively designing our initial project with the best available evidence, then monitoring to address areas of uncertainty, and using our findings to adapt and learn, with every step reinforcing the next. And so, not all teams will start at the beginning. It's actually quite common to go back and forth between steps. So let's start with a quick review of step one, which is focused on helping us define the conservation situation in our project area. After defining our planning purpose and team, we need to define our project scope, vision, and targets. The scope is the geographic area or theme that our project intends to affect. The vision is the ultimate condition that we're working to achieve. And the biodiversity conservation targets are the species and ecosystems that we want to conserve. Remember that our targets are intended to represent the needs of the broader set of natural resources occurring within our project area. To understand the current health of our conservation targets, we complete a viability rating for each target, and then we use this as a baseline to determine the desired future status that we want to achieve over the long term. This desired future status helps us to define our project goals. 
Next, we identify the critical threats that are directly impacting the health, the viability of our conservation targets. As you may recall, direct threats are primarily human activities that immediately degrade a conservation target. In these next images, we'll depict some examples of common direct threats, such as energy production and mining, unsustainable hunting, introduction of exotic and invasive species, unsustainably planned dams and water diversions, wild animal trade, and unsustainable harvests. Because we typically do not have the resources to address all of the threats that affect our species and ecosystems, we use a threat rating exercise like this to identify those threats that are having the greatest impact on our targets and are the most urgent to address. The threat rating table shown here is part of the Eastern Bay Marine Project example that comes as an auto download with Marathi. You will see elements of this Marine Project example in the following slides, and you'll use this example in various exercises throughout this course. Finally, to analyze and illustrate the conservation situation at our project site and depict the relationship between the project scope, target, and threats, we build a situation model. A situation model is a tool that helps us to visually portray the relationships between the different factors in our situation analysis. Using the marine project example here, we can see the project's scope, marine resources in Eastern Bay, and the conservation targets, for example, reefs, sharks, etc. Also note the small colored letters such as G, F, V, and P on the left-hand side of each conservation target circle. These come from the target viability that you carried out a few steps back and they stand for good, fair, very good, and poor. Often teams also want to show how their conservation efforts will contribute to human well-being. They can use a situation model to illustrate how healthy biodiversity targets may provide ecosystem services like flood protection shown here that would contribute to human well-being like home security in this marine project area. Building out the situation model, this diagram shows how the direct threats in the pink boxes are contributing to biophysical impacts in the brown boxes on each of the conservation targets in the marine project area. For example, introduced predators here, or rats, are believed to be contributing to predation of seabird nests, which is reducing the viability of our seabird target. The threat rating of each direct threat is shown in the upper left-hand corner of each pink box. Note how this is high for introduced predators. The dashed arrow here indicates areas of uncertainty in the model where evidence is lacking about the relationship between these factors. For example, here the team was uncertain if the introduced predators are the cause of the seabird nest predation and will need to gather more information to be confident of that. To complete the situation model, we identify and illustrate the contributing factors that we assume are leading to our direct threats. These are depicted with the orange boxes here in this diagram. For example, the team assumes that it is ecotourism boats from the mainland that are reintroducing the rats into this project area. Now, back to our conservation standards cycle, we'll move ahead to look at the next step in this project management cycle. So next we'll do a quick review of step two of the conservation standards. In step two, we use the situation model that we completed in step one to plan our actions and monitoring. This includes selecting our strategies and depicting our assumptions of how we expect these strategies to achieve our stated goals and objectives. To select our strategies, we go back to our situation model and we look for key intervention points in the model where conservation actions could potentially reduce a threat or restore a target. Here you see how the marine project team identified six potential strategies. They're shown as yellow hexagons that could affect a factor in their project area. For example, 
The team reviewed the results of other projects and they found evidence that suggested that an intervention to trap rats on key islands could potentially be effective for reducing the threat of rat predation on seabird nests. After selecting our strategies and interventions, we then develop our theory of change as a results chain. It depicts our assumptions about how we expect a strategy to result in threat reduction and improve the viability of a conservation target. We call these assumptions our theory of change. In the following slides, I will illustrate how you develop a theory of change using a results chain and how you use it to define your actions and monitoring. In this example, our conservation target is marine turtles. Turtles are accidentally injured or killed when they migrate through fishing areas and are attracted to hooks on long lines used to catch fish. To address this threat, the team decided to test and promote circle hooks to reduce bycatch. Here in the yellow bubbles, you can see the activities that the team planned to take under this strategy and the results in a blue box that they expected to see. For example, the team selected this strategy because some evidence existed in the Mexican Pacific that circle hooks may reduce both the hooking rate and the mortality of turtles that are hooked on long line gear. So they assumed in their theory of change that if effectiveness of circle hooks was demonstrated, then fishers would recognize the advantages of circle hooks and that fishers would get circle hooks for free if the project provided a hook exchange program. And if these results occurred in those blue boxes, then the team assumed that the fishermen would accept and use circle hooks, which would in turn then reduce bycatch mortality from hook lines and lead to improved viability of the marine turtle population. This activity planning shown in the yellow boxes was used to develop the project's action plan. It identifies the activities they plan to do and when to achieve these desired results. This slide shows how the team used their results chain to define their long-term goal for turtle conservation. In the green box, you can see that if their intervention was effective, they expected to achieve a 10% increase in turtle abundance by 2025 as compared to 2005. To assess progress towards this goal, they also identify what they will measure, how, when, and where in their monitoring plan. This slide shows how the team used the results chains to set short and long-term objectives in the blue boxes. These depict the desired changes that they believed would be necessary to reach their goal. So this concludes our review of the conservation standards. Step one, assess, and step two, plan. Okay, so let's recap. These are the elements you've now prepared to help you proceed to step three. You've identified your biodiversity conservation targets, completed a viability analysis, identified and rated your direct threats, laid out your situation model and identified key intervention points to prioritize your strategies, laid out your strategies and interventions in a theory of change, and defined your activities and your measurable goals, objectives, and indicators along that theory of change. Now that you have a plan, what's next? This is where an important new journey, your implementation phase, begins. Now that you and your team have completed steps one and two of the conservation standards, you have in your hands a roadmap to guide your journey toward reaching your conservation goals. A map in hand is a very useful tool, but it should not be confused with the territory itself. It is only by venturing into the realm of implementation that you can reach your goals. The next step, step three of the conservation standards, is to implement your actions and monitoring. The upcoming modules in this course will equip you with the instruments to navigate this journey.